Hello, my name is Carrie Biles, and I'm an architect, and I'm a managing partner with Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. I started my career 33 years ago in Chicago and had the profound opportunity to be mentored by Gordon Wildermuth. What made Gordon such a wonderful mentor is a combination of perfection, but also a deep empathy for people. So often he would put forth a challenge to you that just seemed unachievable. And he would demand a great deal of perfection in its execution. And he would work with you until you got there. And I think it was this belief and this drive and this vision and this ability to orchestrate everyone uh, to perform at the highest level um, that really made him an amazing leader as well as an amazing mentor. Throughout his 20 years as a managing partner at SOM, Gordon Wildermuth led many complex projects, but perhaps none more complex and more transformative to the firm than the Hajj Terminal in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I think what Gordon did with the Hajj Terminal is the epitome of what SOM should be. And, and for you know, two reasons beyond just the fact that it was the highest level of integration of you know, multiple disciplines, and, and the two aspects of that that I found most exciting and profound was this passion for completely rethinking the program for uh, a building through, I mean, deep and radical listening about what is really needed and not being afraid to come back to the client and say, I know you thought that this is what you wanted, but really, you know, you need, you know, you need this. The, the other aspect um, of the, the project and Gordon uh, that we really are embracing these days in the firms is this sense of entrepreneurialism. This is creating a project and an opportunity that literally didn't even exist. I mean, this was the largest project that SLM had ever done at that point. It ultimately um, had 600 people working on it. And, and from what I've heard, Gordon literally funded this out of his own pocket for the first few months. And, you know, that's a level of adventure that we rarely ever get to experience in our lives and something that we should continually pursue. If we're going to do dramatic things like address climate change and adapt to the rapidly changing world around us, we need to make giant leaps not incremental changes anymore. So I'd like to see that passion spread across our profession and more giant leaps taking place in the years to come. And now I'd like to share with you an incredible piece of film. It was a short film created in 1981 and it gives a firsthand account of Gordon Wildermuth leading a team, making this incredible project a reality. One of the richest experiences in the life of a Muslim is both spiritual and physical. This is the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca and to the other holy places of Islam in Saudi Arabia. During a 40-day period in the fall, Muslims from all over the world converge on Mecca, as they have for nearly 1,400 years. Most of them enter the kingdom of Saudi Arabia through the Red Sea port of Jeddah, and many of them arrive by air. At the height of the Hajj period, more than 30,000 pilgrims per day may fly into Jeddah. This volume of traffic, which grows greater every year, was too much for the old airport facilities to handle. But beginning with the Hajj of 1981, there was something new and grand to make the long journey more comfortable. It was the opening of the Hajj Terminal one of the architectural wonders of the modern world, and a special welcome to the Hajis from their host, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The Hajj Terminal, the world's largest fabric-roofed structure, is appropriately part of the world's largest airport. The new King Abdulaziz International Airport 
is located 12 miles north of Jeddah and includes two passenger terminals, control tower, a pavilion for the royal family, and other facilities, none more spectacular or significant than the Hajj Terminal. To appreciate the magnitude of its importance, it is necessary to appreciate the meaning and the significance of Hajj. At least once in their lifetimes, Muslims try to make the Hajj to worship at the Kaaba, the ancient Arab shrine in the great mosque in Mecca. This act of faith spread with the advance of Islam. In today's world, travel by jetliner brought the possibility of Hajj to millions of Muslim faithful in every corner of the globe. But with the opportunity of jet travel came the challenge of accommodating the throngs of Hajis pouring through Jeddah during the intense period of Hajj. The solution was the new airport. It was begun in 1974, designed and built by an international consortium of architects, engineers, and contractors, employing at the height of development 11,000 workers from 35 countries. The basic concept for the structure was developed by the airport's designers, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. The key development of the structure was, number one, when we determined that it could not be a building, but it had to be a shaded village. It would be a shaded village in the form of a huge, open-sided roof, sheltering the open areas and the air-conditioned buildings that would house customs, baggage claim, and other services. For a structure of the size required by the traffic, metal or concrete was impractical. Fabric, on the other hand, was not only feasible, but offered the extra benefits of natural lighting and airflow. All the planners at Skid Mowings and Merrill have assured themselves that the layout of the facility is appropriate. We've conducted the tests, we've conducted the studies, uh, movement of passengers, and we're assured that we have the proper layout. So the task before us is to span that enormous space with some economical structure that has, for Perry Gujarol's group, good environmental capability. Now, you know, we talked about this last week. Dr. Khan and his engineers have made a tour of membrane structures and have looked into that material as the possible material that we can use on the Hodge Terminal Complex. And I'd like for Foz to discuss what they have found during this tour and how they feel it's applicable to our particular project that we have here. Well, as, as you uh, recall, our first objective was to find out a material that has the structural qualities so it will last at least 30 to 50 years. It's very important. That was one of the critical item in making that decision. The second was, once we find such a material, it should be sufficiently translucent, but not too much, so that about 10 to 15 percent of the light would come through it, but uh, not more than that. So as we looked around, we found that the Teflon-coated fiberglass was indeed the material that was developed and, in fact, has already served at least a five-year history of uh, very good use in certain buildings, certain structures. We felt it being a tent form, of course, what it did is also evoke the spirit of the architectural form that existed there for hundreds of years. With the structural design of the terminal created, it was found that the best shape for the individual tents or roof units would be a double curved conical form, tensioned and shaped with cables radiating from the center to the four edges. The finished roof would contain 5.5 million square feet of fiberglass fabric, 246 miles of coated cable, and 440 support pylons. Actual construction began in late 1979. The first step was the erection of the pylons. This 
280-ton crane, largest of its kind in the world, lifted the pylons into place, where they were bolted onto concrete footings. The exterior edges of the roof fabric would be supported by these double pylons joined by the diaphragms. The corners of each module would be secured by these four pylon units. And the next step is attaching the cables and roof sections to the pylons in preparation for raising the great roof. Special turntable bed trucks help string the cable between pylons. Giant steel pins anchor the connections. Aluminum clamping plates on these cables secure the edges of the fabric. The tops of each fabric roof section were attached to steel rings. Sections were then lifted by hoist and spread like umbrellas to the edge and ridge cables. Aluminum clamp plates were attached to the perimeter of the fabric and indexed to the clamping plates on the cables. Neoprene gaskets were installed to protect the fabric from abrasion and to form weather seals for the joints and fasteners. It is now February 15th, 1980. All the years invested in planning, designing, testing, manufacturing, and construction have appreciated into the rich excitement of today. The raising of the first section of the Great Roof. This is 467. Section 4, 7, 3, 2, 1, all start. The architects, the engineers, and consultants stand by as 21 electric winches carefully hoisted the first fabric roof to the point of its final docking by hydraulic jacks. Okay, all positions up under number 10. This is main control. Looks fantastic. The Owens Corning Saudi team now has the first module of 21 roof sections in place. Only 18 months after the first module was raised, the roof is up. The date is September 26th, 1981, four months ahead of schedule. As the 650,000 Hajis fly into Jeddah in this historical year of Hajj, this was the hospitable welcome from their hosts, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Upon exiting the terminal building, the pilgrims enter the comfortable, shaded environment created by the great fabric roof. Once this arrival and processing took several days, today it is only a matter of a few hours. In 1981, more than a half million hajis passed through the new Hajj terminal. By the year 2000, it is estimated that their numbers will exceed two million. But with the facilities of the Hajj terminal, combining the design of the timeless desert tent with materials and construction techniques of the space age, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is well prepared for the multitudes.
I'm Derek Moore. I'm a director at SOM, and I lead the firm's practice in airports and transportation. I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to visit the Hodge Terminal a couple of years ago. Uh, we visited on a, a beautiful sunny day in, uh, in, in December, um, and the first appearance of the terminal uh, across uh, really what was part of the part of the desert on a corner of the airport is as impressive as as you can imagine. Uh, it's sort of shimmering uh, in in the distance the the white tents, and the scale is impressive. Uh, the The masts reach 150 feet uh, high, which by the way, is the, the height limit allowed for any structure at an, at an airport other than the air traffic control tower. So the SOM design team had, had uh, in effect, maxed out uh, the building envelope uh, available uh, on the site. But it's the scale inside that, that uh, or under the tents, that's, that's the truly impressive uh, uh, sense that one has. And they, of course, the quality of the light that's filtered um, through the through the tents, the tempering of the of the of the environment. Everyone remarks on the tent structures and the innovation, the structural innovation, the material innovation that shaped those, and rightly so. And they are technically shaped. Obviously, the architectural eye shaped them as well, but they are technically shaped. But they manage also to be subtly elusive of the Haji's tents, the tents that the pilgrims had, had set up at Mecca and Medina for centuries as they made the pilgrimage. So the building in utterly new technology manages to resonate with that deep history. And we so rarely achieve that as architects. That's why I think in many ways the Hodge Terminal is, is the most perfect SOM building.